Hello, everyone. I'm Olympia. Thank you for being here with me in this wonderful place called Lights Out Library. And I have a great story to tell you. Why don't you make yourself comfortable? Grab a drink if you like, or find the right position in your bed, because we just took off for a new space journey. And this one will take us to Mars, the first manned mission to Mars ever. And given that we do it by imagination, I can already tell you that everything's going to work just fine. We'll be back on Earth safe and sound. Along the journey to entertain you during the trip, I will tell you about our destination the Red Planet, and the challenges to overcome travel to Mars, land, stay, and come back. From the energy necessary and the distance to radiation or cohabitation of a small group of astronauts for a several months long journey, we will also talk about terraforming as a concept and how it could be applied to Mars and many other things. As always, you do not need to watch the video to follow along. If you wish to, you may close your eyes and only focus on the sound of my voice as we embark on this adventure together. If you are so kind, please subscribe to my channel and click the like button. This helps support the channel and limits ads as much as possible. Please also follow us on Facebook for announcements. If you fall asleep and wish to resume the video later, or jump directly to a particular part of the story, timestamps are listed below. Also below you will find links to different streaming options like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music. But before we begin, let's take a long, deep, relaxing breath. And when you exhale, release the tension in your shoulders. Release also the tension in your facial muscles. And allow the sound of my voice to guide you through this journey. So, there's a lot to discuss, and Earth is already getting smaller, and we have crossed the orbit of the moon. But there are still millions of miles to cross before we reach Mars. In future space cruises, we will travel faster than light to reach exoplanets and galaxies. Such speeds defy the laws of physics as we know them and there is good reason to estimate that they cannot physically be achieved. But tonight, we are traveling at just a few percentage points of speed of light, which will be enough to complete the round trip in about an hour. Such a speed has never been reached by men, but it is theoretically possible, at least. So, what is the distance between Earth and Mars? There isn't a single answer to this question, because the distance is constantly changing. Since you tuned into this story, the distance has changed by thousands of miles as the two planets follow their orbits around the Sun at high speed. Sometimes they are on either side of the sun. And when this happens, Mars is invisible from Earth. When the two planets are on opposite sides of the sun, the distance is the maximum and it reaches 400 million kilometers. This would be like 10,000 times the circumference of the Earth. But there are also times when Mars is much closer, when Earth and Mars are aligned on the same side of the Sun, 
and in this case, the distance drops to about 55 million kilometers, almost eight times less. This is less than 40 million miles. About every 26 months, Mars reaches what it's called a close approach to Earth. This close approach is an advantageous moment. That is the right moment to send missions to Mars. But the distance when a close approach happens is not always exactly the same because it is not that simple. The two orbits of Earth and Mars are not exactly on the same plane. They are slightly tilted with respect to each other, and the exact shapes of these orbits constantly change because they are influenced by the position of other bodies, especially Jupiter, which has a significant influence on the orbit of Mars. At the scale of the solar systems, calculations have to be made to take into account velocities and the influence of all bodies involved. Therefore, there is a lot of modeling and mathematics involved in making accurate estimates. This is crucial because a probe cannot afford to miss its constantly moving destination which can be millions of miles away. A good understanding of orbital speeds and all the factors that impact them is necessary to prevent such mishaps. With all these elements at play, not all close approaches between Mars and Earth are exactly the same. In 2003, Mars made its closest approach to the Earth in 60,000 years. And it won't be that close again until the year 2287. In the meantime, humans will have to travel a greater distance to close the gap between Earth and Mars. NASA has two missions related to Mars in the works. The Artemis mission is meant to establish a U.S. spaceport on the moon for future deep space launches. The Artemis mission is meant to establish a U.S. spaceport on the moon for future deep space launches. The Artemis crew of three Americans and one Canadian will fly by the moon in 2024 then land on the moon in 2025. The first time humans will have done so since 1972. The second mission is known simply as the Mars Sample Return, a campaign to bring samples of Mars soil and rocks back to Earth. Given that probes or spaceships need to return, these missions will need to be planned over several years. It is not possible to just arrive, land on Mars, take samples for a few weeks, and then immediately return, because during that time spent on the planet, the distance from Earth will have increased by millions and millions of miles and the distance, time, and space are not the only elements that matter. The energy needed to land and return is maybe even more important. Even the shortest trip is not necessarily the most realistic or achievable. Storing fuel is complicated after all. It takes up a lot of room and it's very heavy, thereby requiring energy in the form of fuel to transport fuel as part of a spaceship's cargo. As soon as space flight began, astronomers and engineers started studying 
the most efficient paths into space. When it comes to energy consumption, an economical way of traveling between planets is to jump from one orbit to another, following an elliptical orbit. This kind of transfer is called the Hohmann transfer orbit. This is the orbit followed, for example, by the InSight probe sent by NASA a few years ago. It implies approximately a nine-month travel time from Earth to Mars, then stay about 16 to 17 months on Mars, waiting for the next transfer window. Another nine-month trip to return to Earth. That is to say, three years in total for the round trip. A method that can help consume less energy when approaching the target planet is called ballistic capture. And what is it? When spacecraft use the home and transfer orbit, it typically requires the spacecraft to burn fuel in order to slow down at the distant planet because when the ship approaches it, it travels faster in space than its destination. It has to catch up with it. The fuel necessary to slow down has to be transported all the way from Earth, which adds to the cost and complexity of the craft. However, with the method of ballistic capture, the spacecraft is just placed in advance on the orbit of its destination planet before the planet arrives. When the target arrives, the craft is captured by the planet's gravity and can pull itself in orbit around it with small thrusters for adjustment. Another possible method to slow down spacecraft when they reach their target is a maneuver called aerobraking. Aerobraking consists of flying the craft through the atmosphere, so it has to be a body with an atmosphere at the low point of the orbit. The friction and drag slow it down, and the advantage is that this method uses the environment and doesn't consume more energy than necessary to position the craft on the right orbit. All of this gives you an idea of the variety of mission plans and possible paths that have been imagined and tested. We are now halfway to our destination. So before we talk about landing and the environment we will find on Mars, Let's take a look at the formation of the planet and what it is made of. As you may know, the dominant theory about the formation of planets in our solar system is that they all started with a large accretion disk, a disk of gases and dust that was kept together and put in motion by gravitation. Most of the mass of matter concentrated in the center to form the sun, but not all of it. The periphery of the new star was still filled with matter, with dust in orbit around it. Through collisions over millions and millions of years, this dust snowballed into bigger and bigger rocks and boulders after millions of revolutions around the sun. Bigger rocks and protoplanets progressively cleaned up their orbits of dust and smaller bodies by absorbing them or turning them into their satellites like Earth. This process is believed to have been completed about four and a half billion years ago for Mars. At this point, rocky planets in the solar system 
had eliminated most of the smaller rocks and boulders in their orbits, and they had taken a ball shape. This globe shape occurs because of gravity. Above a certain size, bodies become round, whereas smaller objects like asteroids or comets can't maintain other shapes. They are not large enough or massive enough to form a ball of matter. It is difficult to determine the history of Mars from Earth. On our planet, we can study the geological timeline by analyzing the layers of rocks and minerals. On Mars, nothing like that has been done yet. A few samples of soil could be analyzed by probes, but nothing comparable. However, it doesn't mean hypotheses cannot be made. The age of the surface of the planet can be estimated by counting the number of visible craters. A higher number in density of crater points to older terrain. However, Mars has also experienced intense volcanism along its history, and volcanism resets the surface terrain. It also has glaciers, winds, and possibly running water in the past, so craters may have been erased. With these limited means of estimating the age of the surface, the oldest part is believed to be in the southern hemisphere. The surface there would be about 3.8 billion years old. In the northern hemisphere, the landscapes are dominated by large plains that would have appeared later after the last waves of bombardment by asteroids. It is believed that after its formation approximately 400 million years ago, 4.5 to 4.1 billion years ago, Mars had a dense atmosphere. This atmosphere was formed as a result of asteroid and comet impacts, as well as gases escaping from the planet's mantle. This early atmosphere would have been much denser than Earth's, implying higher pressure. Under these conditions, water vapor in the atmosphere could have condensed into an ocean, possibly even a global ocean. However, this ocean would have existed at high temperatures, similar to a pressure cooker. Over millions of years, this large body of water started to cool down, potentially creating the first opportunity for the emergence of life, around 4.4 to 4.3 billion years ago. It is important to note that this is purely speculative and based on modeling. There is no direct proof of it. In any case, this early atmosphere would have lacked stability, because as the planet kept cooling down, it would have escaped into space or become incorporated into the surface. After liquid water and high pressure, the atmosphere would have become thinner and thinner and the planet increasingly cold. As a result, turning water into ice. The following 400 million years from 4.1 to 3.7 billion years ago, new drastic changes, bombardment by asteroids could have kept happening, like on Earth. In the southern hemisphere, the surface would date from this period, like on Earth. Mars probably has a liquid core made primarily of metal. Metals tend to converge to the center of planets 
due to their higher mass. The core is covered by a mantle and a much thinner solid crust. On average, this crust today would be around 50 kilometers thick compared to 40 kilometers on Earth. Once again, this is an estimate that looks possible, even reasonable. However, contrary to Earth, it could not be proven directly and by multiple methods. But at the time, four billion years ago, this crust was much thinner, and the planet had a period of intense volcanic activity. Great volcanoes appeared. After our landing, we will pay a visit to one of them, Olympus Mons. The fracturing of the surface made a large rift valley system appear as a result of this volcanic activity, pooling gases and ashes into the atmosphere. The planet would have stopped cooling down because the thicker blanket of gases trapped more solar heat, causing a greenhouse effect. At this point, clouds probably developed, and with them, precipitations running to the ground. This could explain the valleys that were possibly dug by running water billions of years ago through erosion. At the time, there could have been also lakes forming in the basins and craters, maybe even an ocean covering the north of the planet. A clue that points to such a scenario. With the existence of an ocean or at least running water is the analysis of rocks on the surface by rovers. They indicate the presence of clay minerals that typically form by prolonged exposure to groundwater. During this second period, another window for the possible emergence of life, the second one theoretically opened. There was liquid water, an atmosphere, and also maybe a magnetic field around the planet, like on Earth. The inside would have been in motion, like on Earth, creating a magnetic dynamo that would have shielded the planet from radiation. In theory, this would make several of the conditions that allowed the appearance of life on Earth possibly present on Mars at the time. But again, these conditions didn't last more than a few dozen million years. Mars is a smaller planet than Earth, and as a result, it cooled down faster. Therefore, the magnetic dynamo would have shut down, causing the magnetic field to disappear. However, more concerning for the possibility of life on the surface is the fact that atmospheric conditions continue to change due to Mars' smaller mass compared to Earth. Without a magnetic field, Mars kept losing its atmosphere, which dissipated into space over millions of years. Eventually, what remains of the atmosphere started to cool down again and with the accumulation of gases like sulfur pulled by volcanoes, rains would have become increasingly acidic over a period of 800 million years until about 3.6 billion years ago. Once again, this hypothesis is supported by the analysis of soils that were apparently altered by acidic groundwater. As the temperature went down, much of the water would have frozen, possibly under the surface bombardments by asteroids that had become less and less frequent over hundreds of millions of years. They almost came to a halt, like on Earth, 
at the same time in the rest of the solar system, maybe eventually, there were still asteroid impacts that melted huge quantities of surface ice and caused catastrophic floods. However, these floods could only be short-lived because the water was reabsorbed into the ground and frozen again. After a billion and a half years of catastrophic reverses in its appearance in atmosphere, Mars then entered a period of relative stability that continues to this day. During this stability, in the sense that there were no more large-scale geological changes or climatic changes, the surface of Mars became dry, bearing little resemblance to its previous atmospheres. The new atmosphere has become so thin that there is very little pressure at the surface, so much so that water vaporizes instantly upon reaching the surface. Therefore, there can no longer be liquid water. Over three billion years, there was still erosion, with powerful winds occasionally. Volcanoes appeared and modified the surface, like they do on Earth. But there doesn't seem to be plate tectonics, like on Earth. The face of Mars may not have changed radically for a long time. Now, seen from space, it has this red color that comes from oxidation of iron. It is rust that gives Mars its name of the red planet. The poles remain covered in ice, and the size of this ice continent at the poles probably varies over very long periods, depending on the distance from Mars to the Sun. I will tell you more about the conditions at the surface, but it is now time to land, because we have reached our destination. We made this journey quickly, but for astronauts it will take months. Astronauts have already spent extended periods of time in space, including more than necessary to reach Mars. But it was in space stations that remained on the low-orbit veranda. The psychological burden of knowing you are traveling further and further away from your planet in a potentially dangerous adventure, and in an environment where only technology can keep you alive cannot be overlooked. This probably recreates the experience of the explorers who left Europe by sea in the 15th and 16th centuries, with their crews at the mercy of unpredictable oceans for months. There were situations of mutiny or despair. Now, this human factor can certainly be overcome by selecting highly trained astronauts and ensuring their group dynamic works for the mission. However, the psychological and social dimensions of such a journey bring challenges that cannot be fully eliminated. Additionally, there are biological and physical difficulties. Human bodies had not evolved for life in space, especially in zero-gravity environment. It is not just the loss of bone or muscle when we don't need to compensate for gravity for an extended period of time. There are other aspects that affect metabolism and the way our body heals. For example, it would be more difficult to treat a fracture without gravity. And this is something astronauts would need to pay attention to, as they could not afford to hurt themselves. But the biggest medical issue in space is certainly radiation. On Earth, we are shielded from radiation by our magnetic field and the atmosphere. 
The radiations we talk about here are streams of tiny particles, bits of atoms or energy that exist in space or come from the sun. The sun ejects them constantly in every direction and they travel through the solar system. This is a big problem for extended stays in space because it is hard to fully shield against them including inside spaceships or stations. One day, spent in the International Space Station, for example, is the equivalent to roughly ten sessions of chest x-rays. If it is for a day or two, there are no measurable consequences. But when it is for months, the damage to the DNA eyes, and the immune system can become concerning. And it is more than enough to significantly increase the risk of cancer. This is far from being the worst place in space. It is on a low orbit and still within the Earth's magnetic field. So traveling further in space will imply higher doses of radiation, and even more insidious effect of radiation exposure is that it may affect cognitive function over time. Making astronauts less able to respond to enforcing circumstances or stressful situations. So what can be done to minimize the problem of radiation? There are vests in development made of materials that are efficient at blocking free particles, like proteins. For example, vests made of polyethylene. Polyethylene is easy to make. It is a plastic. We use it all the time. And it is the material used for bottled water. There are radiation-sensing instruments that could alert astronauts when they pass through a place where radiation is more intense and they can move to a part of the craft where there is better shielding. Metals that make the hulls of spacecraft are not good at stopping radiation. But other materials apart from polyethylene, for example hydrogen, work well. It would be possible to integrate hydrogen-rich materials into the spacecraft's structure, or maybe just line the walls with water tanks. Now, these options also raise issues of weight, because all this has to be sent into space. Another solution being explored by scientists, and it sounds a lot like science fiction, is to give the craft its own electromagnetic field generated by a device on board the craft. It is possible for the long term and it creates other problems like the energy necessary to make it work constantly. However, that would be an ideal long-term solution to the problems of radiation for space travel because until such a solution is found, longer haul space travel with astronauts will be hard and a direct threat to their health. One day in space outside the magnetic field of the Earth is equivalent to about 700 days on Earth when it comes to the dose of radiation received. It's almost like two years in a single day. In other terms, in one month in space outside the Earth's magnetic field, astronauts receive almost the equivalent of a lifetime of radiation on Earth if they are not protected. At this point, the issue of shielding against radiation is one of the biggest stakes for scientists who work on future manned missions to Mars, or beyond that. We have now reached the proximity of Mars. 
and the first leg of our trip is done. Sometimes there are storms of dust on the planet that can reach global dimensions and completely hide the ground. This is one of the difficulties of the harsh environment we will find at the surface, but not today. Through the very thin atmosphere of the planet, we can directly see the ground and its variety of plains and craters, mainly in the southern hemisphere. We see mountains and rifts, all in various shades of red to brown, except for the white caps of ice at the poles. These caps are primarily water ice, but not only. They also contain frozen carbon dioxide. Like Earth, Mars has seasons because the planet rotates on an axis that is not perfectly perpendicular to its orbit. This means it does not always present the same side to the sun. When it is summer for one hemisphere or pole, that particular area receives direct sunlight. Meanwhile, the other hemisphere or pole experiences winter and remains in darkness for a month. Without an atmosphere to regulate temperatures, like on our planet, the dark pole becomes extremely cold, causing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to freeze and fall to the ground. This results in a layer of carbon dioxide ice covering the dark pole. However, when summer arrives, sunlight causes carbon dioxide to sublime. That is, it instantaneously converts it from a solid to a gas. Carbon dioxide liberated as gas brings dust with it in the atmosphere, and clouds form, clouds that look like cirrus clouds on Earth, until the next change of season when carbon dioxide freezes again and falls back to the ground. We will keep exploring the surface, but now, let's land. We will do it probably like the first human missions will land in a rocket, so that we would be able to take off at the end of the mission and return to the spacecraft left in orbit around the planet and start the trip back to Earth. A dozen small spacecraft have already landed successfully on Mars since the 1970s. There was a Mars 3 sent by the Soviet space program and Viking 1 and 2 by NASA. Then there was a long period when funding issues and other priorities put missions to Mars on hold. They resumed 20 years later in the 1990s with the appearance of rovers like Sojourner, Opportunity, Curiosity, and more recently, Perseverance, which landed in February 2021. Because of these missions that have collected samples, sent images from the ground, and the cartography made by probes in orbit, our knowledge of Mars has increased. It has improved dramatically in the past 40 or 50 years. Clearly, between these successful missions and the various long-term projects or manned missions from public and private agents that exist at the moment, Mars is a hot topic in the world of astronautics. A human mission is unlikely to take place this decade, but the next? Why not? This raises questions about whether it is worth it and how much it would cost. Apart from the risks of failure and the huge complexity, an obvious limiting factor is the cost. It is estimated to be roughly $500 billion. This is a lot, or not that much, depending on how you look at it. 
If you compare it to the world's economy, $500 billion is not that much. The world's GDP, the gross domestic product, is $104 trillion, so half a trillion would be 0.6 of one year of the world's economy. In other terms, it is equivalent to less than two days of economic activity on Earth. As a species, the perspective to try and go to another planet for the first time ever for the equivalent of two days of work doesn't seem like much. It can also be argued that this spending is also an investment for a part. This is the kind of project that needs research and materials, processes, fuels, and equipment of all sorts that could have other beneficial uses. However, this amount is well above the budget of any space agency or private investor, and it would certainly not be profitable financially. There are resources that could be exploited on Mars by a human community living there, such as water, metals, and maybe many other materials to be discovered, but there is probably no treasure to find. It would be for the sake of knowledge, for science, for the challenge itself, or the perspective to one day establishing a permanent human presence on Mars. It has been argued that this last point makes sense as a species for humankind. A presence on different planets strongly reduces the risk of extinction. If we wish to consider this a goal because, apart from that, there are plenty of places on Earth that are currently unpopulated by humans, and that would be much easier and cheaper to colonize, like the poles, Arctic regions, deserts, or even the bottom of the seas. Each is inhospitable, but they are still way more welcoming than Mars for us. Even in the terrible cold and lack of vegetation of the Antarctic, for example, where the only human presence is on bases, at least there is air to breathe, there is pressure, so you can go without a pressurized suit. And the temperature is actually almost pleasant if you compare it to Mars. On Mars, the atmosphere is too thin to retain heat at night, and it is further away from the sun than Earth. The average temperature is minus 60 degrees Celsius, which is minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. At best, the temperature near the equator during the day can rise up to 20 degrees Celsius, which is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It doesn't sound too bad. But in the same location, the temperature at night will drop to minus 73 degrees Celsius, minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. There is no place on Earth where the temperature varies by 100 degrees in a single day. In addition, the atmosphere on Mars is 100 times less dense and contains 95% carbon dioxide. So there is nothing to breathe for us. The problem of radiation and the dust storms can rage for weeks. We'll make for a harsh environment. Any human community would face a precarious situation, relying solely on their equipment. They would probably need to find shelter underground or under anti-radiation domes. Additionally, they would desperately need to find water for extracting oxygen and irrigation for production. The production of energy, likely through solar panels, would also be risky if the sun is obscured by dust for an extended period. Pressurizing the living space would be necessary, 
All these factors carry significant risk, leaving no room for failure. Now, with the same amount of funding, it would be much easier to create an entire underground or underwater city on Earth that could exist and function completely separate from the rest of the world. Doesn't sound useful, and no one is going to invest in this. But if the argument in favor of establishing bases on Mars is to gain living space or protect humanity from extinction, it doesn't really work that well considering it could be done on Earth. But still, the challenge is fascinating. I think and I hope a human mission to Mars will one day leave Earth and succeed. One of the interesting questions it could answer would be the presence of traces of life on the planet. Even if it is long extinct or dormant. If life appeared at some point on another planet in the solar system, then it would strongly suggest that the conditions that allow the existence of life are not that extraordinary. That would be a powerful argument in favor of the existence of life in multiple locations, multiple places in our galaxy. But having a base and a few scientists seems absolutely impossible, however difficult it is in the not-so-distant future. Now, it is not forbidden to dream, and for a longer time, the concept that has circulated since the 20th century is the idea of transforming Mars or other planets to make them more similar to Earth, inhabitable by humans and Earth-like life. As you know, this is called terraforming. What is terraforming? And is it just a dream or something that could happen for real? The concept appeared in science fiction in the 1940s. It is not that recent. The first notable scientific article about it was written by an astronomer named Carl Sagan in 1961. In this article, he proposed a theoretical way of transforming the planet Venus to make it habitable. At the time, it was known that Venus had a very dense atmosphere that created a powerful greenhouse effect, keeping surface temperatures at unbearable levels hundreds of degrees. The composition of the atmosphere was roughly known. It had water, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide. So he proposed the idea of seeding this atmosphere with algae. It is so dense that algae would have stayed in suspension. They wouldn't fall to the ground and be incinerated. Algae would have converted the components of the atmosphere into organic compounds by feeding on them, especially carbon dioxide. This would have progressively removed carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and reduced the greenhouse effect until temperatures dropped to more comfortable levels, and the carbon would have remained captive in a blanket of matter that would have fallen to the surface. The oxygen would have to rise to make the air breathable. That was clever. But later discoveries showed that it couldn't work because the clouds of Venus are very rich in sulfuric acid that would have destroyed algae. And another problem, even more insurmountable, was that the atmosphere was just too tense. 
algae might break carbon dioxide into carbon and oxygen, but oxygen would have stayed high, whereas pure carbon would have fallen to the surface, been incinerated, and through combustion returned to the atmosphere as a gas. Sagan also proposed a terraforming project in Mars in the 1970s, and because it is certainly the planet most similar to Earth in the solar system, the concept of terraforming Mars has persisted for decades. As we saw earlier, it is not impossible that Mars had an Earth-like environment in its history long ago with a thicker atmosphere and abundant water, possibly liquid water. If the mechanisms that caused this atmosphere change occurred, they could potentially be reversed. I previously mentioned the likely reasons that caused Mars to lose most of its atmosphere. One reason is the absence of a magnetic field which allows solar wind to carry the atmosphere away. Additionally, Mars has lower gravity compared to Earth. At the surface of Mars, an object weighing 100 pounds on Earth would only weigh 38 pounds. As a result, astronauts walking on the surface would not be able to generate as much force as on the Moon but they would feel lighter compared to Earth. Furthermore, the lower gravity means that the atmosphere is less tightly bound to the planet compared to more massive planets. And finally, the last reason for the loss of this atmosphere is that when there is carbon dioxide in an atmosphere and water is present, it tends to react with rocks at the surface to form carbonates, which are solid salts. So, this tends to draw the atmosphere off and bind it to the surface. This happens on Earth, but due to volcanic activity that ejects new gases into the atmosphere, there is a kind of balance. And the Earth's atmosphere doesn't get eroded by its absorption into the surface. So, between these various effects, Mars' atmosphere was probably in the past carried away into space and absorbed by the planet itself. These problems are due to the mass of Mars, the lack of enough volcanic activity, and the absence of a planetary magnetic field. These problems cannot go away easily. This is what Mars is. And for these reasons, it looks complicated to give it an Earth-like atmosphere. Because even assuming it could be done technically and financially, this atmosphere would be unstable and would need constant maintenance and constant readjustments to stay in place it would have to be replaced artificially as it tends to get thinner without intervention. There are other technical problems. In order to be habitable, this atmosphere would have to be heated. Mars receives less light than Earth from the sun because of the distance. The light level is about 60% of Earth's only. So if an atmosphere with the same composition and density as Earth were created, with the same greenhouse effect that retains heat, it would still be insufficient to raise the temperatures above zero degrees Celsius. And water would stay frozen instead of becoming liquid. And then, even if all of this could be overcome, the soil is toxic for us. It contains a lot of chlorine. Too much to make it suitable for agriculture. It would also have to be chemically modified. 
all of these problems, and there are others, actually have solutions that are technically possible and often within our technological reach. However, in practice, it clearly looks undoable for the moment. At the scale of an entire planet, we just don't have enough energy and the possibility to send the huge equipment necessary to Mars. But let's imagine we tried. What could be the methods employed to terraform Mars? The starting point would have to be to generate a greenhouse effect that is mostly absent at the moment by injecting gases into the atmosphere. These gases would trap solar heat near the surface and help start the process of global heating that could one day make the water at the poles and underground melt. They would also increase pressure and make it more bearable for humans. At the moment, the pressure is just 1% of Earth's pressure, so a pressurized suit is absolutely necessary. However, if this pressure reached just 25 or 30% of Earth, it would already be possible to go out without a suit. Just an oxygen mask would be sufficient. There are compounds with a significant greenhouse effect such as ammonia and hydrocarbons that are abundant in the solar system and could be imported to Mars. We know where to find them, for example, on the moons of Jupiter. However, these compounds are relatively light, and it could be hard, especially at the beginning, to make them stay around the planet. Another option would be to release gases with very powerful greenhouse effects into the atmosphere, such as fluorine compounds. These include the famous CFCs that became known for attacking the ozone layer on Earth. But they are also very powerful greenhouse gases. In fact, they are thousands of times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Fluorine is present in the Mars crust in higher quantities than on Earth, as far as we know. So an idea could be to manufacture these compounds from the materials present in the soil and release them into the atmosphere. Alternatively, send rockets with payloads of compressed CFCs. When it comes to warming the planet, a proposed solution would be to use orbital mirrors to redirect more sunlight to the surface. They could also be targeted at the poles and their layers of solid carbon dioxide to try and sublimate it and help kickstart the greenhouse effect. Another necessity would be to oxygenate this atmosphere if it becomes dense and hard enough. Science fiction often uses the idea of seeding the planet with algae or vegetation. In general, this could help, but it is not such a good solution because the net production of oxygen by terrestrial plants is quite small, even on Earth. Plants reabsorb oxygen at night, and in fact, on Earth, more than two-thirds of oxygen is produced, generated by the oceans. Liquid water would probably be necessary to fill the atmosphere with oxygen and support vegetable life capable of initially withstanding the extreme conditions of low pressure and cold. Alternatively, water could be introduced, or an alternate solution could be the creation of oxygen from water in industrial plants. As you know, oxygen is the main component of water along with hydrogen. Finally, 
even if all of this could be sorted out, there will always be the problem of Mars and its ability to retain its atmosphere. As a solution, the idea of creating an artificial magnetic field has been proposed, which in theory could be achieved with superconducting rings built around the planet, through which electric current would constantly circulate. At the scale of a planet, this is, of course, very theoretical. So, as you can see, the terraforming of Mars is not for tomorrow, or even the day after tomorrow. But at the end of the day, technical solutions are not completely out of reach. It could become a viable project in the future if mankind had considerable sources of cheap energy at its disposal, far more than today. However, with equipment that could harvest the sun's energy or generate it through fusion, it is not completely unthinkable in several generations. Before we leave Mars, I told you we would visit a volcano. Mars may be smaller than Earth, but it is home to one of the largest and tallest mountains known in the solar system. Olympus Mons. Olympus is an enormous shield volcano, which means it has grown a very wide base made of lava. It has ejected throughout its history. Olympus Mons has a surface as big as Italy or Great Britain, and its peak reaches 26 kilometers high, or 16 miles. That is more than twice the height of Mount Everest. It is believed that such a large volcano could appear because of the lack of plate tectonics on Mars. On Earth, a lot of the energy and pressure in the crust is released in rifts between plates, and volcanoes are not eternal. They are parts of plates that move and may disappear in the very, very long term. But when this mechanism doesn't exist, the volcano can stay in place and keep releasing lava for hundreds of millions of years. This is probably why and how Olympus Mons could reach such a size. And this is interesting because if lava keeps nearing the surface on Mars and assuming there are pockets of water trapped underground, then in some particular locations, there may be liquid water beneath the surface, water heated by a geothermal source. There are so many other interesting things to say about Mars. It also has satellites. We are at an exciting moment historically when it comes to space exploration. After the initial exploits of going to the moon and sending probes to the various corners of the solar system in the 1960s, space exploration has slowed down in the following decades. But there is a resurgence happening at the moment with different actors. There is NASA, private companies, China, the ESA, Russia, Japan. Many of the missions and projects are planned and collaborative. Maybe not with China, but in general they are. It still may seem painfully slow when you follow space news on a daily basis. These projects take years. But on a historical scale, it seems we are returning to the kind of excitement there used to be in the 1950s and 1960s, and I am happy about it. So, we are now going to return to Earth because this is the end of our journey for tonight. As always, I hope you liked it and learned a few things. 
You can now let go and fall asleep. I'll talk to you soon with a new exploration journey. And until we meet again, good night. Sleep well. <laughs>